42 is a number made forever mem memorable by Jackie Robinson. Each year in April, when the time comes around for the first game that Jackie Robinson ever played for the Brooklyn Dodgers, everyone wears 42 everywhere in baseball at all levels of play. And you know what? That number is not allowed to be on any jersey for any team any other time. 42 is special. But 42 is also special for us. The first 27 women and 15 men who founded First Church were amazing people. They were titans and they were temperers of tools. They were homemakers and one was the 11th mayor of Columbus. They were clerks and newspaper men. They were farmers and horticulturalists and temperance movement leaders. They were jewelers and grocers, doctors and lawyers and authors. Some of them founded the Columbus Museum of Art and the Columbus College of Art and Design and Mount Carmel Hospital. Later, Grant Hospital and Children's Hospital, inspired by the forebears who came before them, were founded by members of First Church. Some were born in Ireland and England. Some came from families as far away as Worthington, Ohio, and then parts of other Ohio. And then some had just arrived from Massachusetts and Connecticut and Missouri. They were young and they were older. The oldest was 62, so I don't want to say they were old, just older, right? They were women and men. They were 64% women and 36% men. By my count, they brought at least 15 little children between the age of newborn to teen, but they would produce many more, as you'll hear. They were all amazing. They were all talented. They were all faithful to the work of social justice. They were all convicted with the call of Jesus Christ to serve the least, and these particularly African-American brothers and sisters who were enslaved and needed to be free forever. Thanks to the hard work of one of our members, and I need you to stand, David. David Mailer stands. Amy, get him up. This guy, I sent him a text on a morning walk with my dogs, and he found months of work <laughs> in, his, in his portfolio. David did the research that brought us this information. Thank you, David. But as David would tell you, the labor of love is never done alone. You were joined by others at the Columbus Public Library and the Ohio History Connection, and you found historians that were more than willing to share information with you from all over. We will share more with you as the picture becomes even more complete, but today I want to tell you about 26 of the 42. So I have to move quickly, because that's a lot of people. Please join me in prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. On this actual day, Friday, September 24th, 1852, 42 people transferred their membership from Second Presbyterian Church and formed Third Presbyterian Church. It was 171 years ago this day. Our congregation's history begins in the hearts and minds of faithful dissent. By the late 1840s, a growing movement of Christian abolitionists was gaining strength in the struggle against slavery. Abolitionist Christians could no longer abide in the union of Christian faith and a nation which embraced it in any way, and they embraced the existence of slaves or slave owners. In Columbus in 1852, a cluster of believers, as they called themselves, decided that they would become Congregationalists, but they were told by the Congregationalists, no, there's no Congregational churches, so don't do that, stay Presbyterian. And they really didn't do that very well, because they never joined the Presbytery, Larry, so they weren't good Presbyterians. <laughs> anyway, they became Third Presbyterian Church for a bit of time. But they were sent that day with one of the most beautiful benedictions ever offered one group of people leaving to form a new church. Listen to these words. 
that their sisters and brothers at Second Church sent them with. In view of the importance of this occasion, we all add our expression of sympathy with those who leave us and an earnest desire that the great head of the church may be with them and help them. May he make them a church of his own to glorify him and promote his kingdom in all the world. And may those who remain and those who go, when toil is here finished, meet in heaven and together form a more perfect part of the church triumphant there. They sent them with $1,000 too, which in our equivalency is $39,362.31 today at least. Provided with this, they headed out. The newly formed church purchased some land on the northeast corner of Lynn Alley and 3rd Street, which is now the entrance to the Renaissance Hotel parking garage. So we need to put a plaque there. <laughs> so there was a framed chapel erected. A formal call was extended to the Reverend William H. Marble, and under Reverend Marble's earnest and integral leadership, the chapel was dedicated, and the congregation first worshiped in their new chapel on September 26, 1852, as 27 women and 15 men and their children gathered to praise God and turn their resistance to slavery into faithful action. They officially signed the charter on Wednesday the 29th, so they took a week to do this. It's kind of nice. By 1856, the church was fittingly renamed the First Congregational Church of Columbus. And for the sake of Tom Brownfield, I have to add, there was a congregational church in town already called the Welsh Congregational Church. So First Congregational Church went over to them and said, do you want the name? And they said, of course not, we're Welsh. <laughs> so they, we got it, right? Thank you, Tom, for your people. <laughs> so, so there it was. They were starting, and now they moved for a more spacious building. They moved forward. The, Henry Bowen, a leading abolitionist and congregationalist in New York, said, buy a lot, face the State House, and build a good building. Make them look at you every day and see that you are there. The bravest policy is the best. They did just that. They purchased land directly across from the State House on the north side of Broad Street and began to build their little church, or their big church in this case, under the leadership of a new pastor, Reverend Steele. It was five months into his pastorate that the young and energetic Reverend Steele set out for New York City to raise $7,000 from the abolitionists of New York for their Norman-style building. Tragically, he contracted smallpox during the pursuit and died shortly after. Grieving this loss, the brave little congregation pressed on and in December of 1857, dedicated their new building at 74 East Broad, which is now the parking lot behind Key Bank, if you know the spaces on this side of the street and sort of diagonal from Trinity Episcopal. That became the location for 74 years until we opened this building in 1931, in December 31. First Congregational Church was the first white abolitionist church in Columbus, Ohio. As early Christian abolitionists, we joined with several other black congregations, including Second Baptist Church under the leadership of Reverend James Preston Poindexter, free slaves who were supporting the Underground Railroad movement. Now, Second Baptist was right behind First Church on Gay Street, so our back doors were back doors to one another. Our fellowship in those early years tied us closely to our sister black abolitionist congregations. And together we formed the first interracial work for justice in Columbus's history. That's significant. Our origin story is a remarkable story of determination and commitment to racial justice. I've often wondered what happened on that first day of First Church. I know you think, don't you have something else to think about? No, because this is very significant in the history of this, of this place. Here are the names in alphabetical order because that's how they signed the book, which I love. They all got in line and signed in alphabetical order from one to 42. I am going to read these names aloud because I want you to hear the names of the men and women. I want you to remember these people. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. We just wouldn't be here. And I think it's important because I have never read these names 
in this church when any of you were in the room. The only other time was in September of 2020 when I was here and you were out virtually. So listen to their names. Mrs. Amelia Adams, Mr. Thomas S. Baldwin, Mrs. Matilda A. Baldwin, Mr. Michael B. Batham, Mrs. Josephine C. Batham, Mrs. Elisa Berggrap, Mrs. Ilona Edgar, Mrs. Sarah Ann Edwards, Mr. Charles H. Goss, Mrs. Sarah Goss, Mr. Andrew Gunning, Mrs. Mary M. Gunning, Dr. J. C. Hamilton, Mrs. Rachel H. Hamilton, Reverend Warren Jenkins, Mrs. Mary M. Jenkins, Mr. Matthew Long, Mrs. Mary Long, Mrs. A. E. B. McGrary, Mrs. Mary E. Osgood, Mr. George Otscott, Mrs. Elizabeth Otscott, Miss Dana C. Pearson, Mrs. Phoebe D. Rankin. Now that name should be familiar to all abolitionists because the Rankins were connected to Rankin House on the Ohio River, I'm sure. Where was I? Got lost. Okay. Mrs. Mary Jane Reed, Mrs. L. L. Rice, Mrs. Sarah Rice, Mr. L. L. Rice, Mrs. Sarah Rice, Miss Elizabeth Ridgeway, Mrs. Mary Searles, Mr. Francis C. Sessions, Mrs. Mary J. Sessions, Mrs. Lydia Stanton, Mr. Samuel B. Stanton, Mrs. A. E. Strickland, Mrs. Elizabeth Tuttle, Mr. James R. Tuttle, Mr. C. Wall, Mrs. Elizabeth Wall, Miss Mary White, Mrs. Jane Wilkins, Mr. Abram Alvin Wright, and Mrs. Mary A. Wright. Who were these people? What were their stories? How did they get to America? How did they get to Ohio? What did they do? How many children did they have and grandchildren? What became of them in the years that followed? What drove them to do the right thing for racial justice, for social justice? We learned a few things. Well, David learned a few things that he shared with me about the 27 women and 15 men, mostly through obituaries and other digging. The oldest was 62. The youngest was 17 when they signed the book. We know many of them lived long lives, and because they lived long lives, we eventually were able to find their obituaries longer living. And a good number stayed at First Church well into the years of Washington Gladden, and some outlived Washington Gladden. Most died in Ohio and are buried here, but some are buried in Hawaii. The longer they lived, the better chance we had to find information about them. So I will share little parts of what we know. Like a hearty stew, these women and men are deep and rich, and so are their tre treasured truths, which we found out about them. I will start with what is the least information and move to the most. So they're not in alphabetical order. Abram Alvin Wright, was a temperer of tools. Temperer of tools, as I understand it from my reading, is someone who makes the tool work, so tests it by fire and makes the tool work. He was born in Massachusetts in 1821. Mary A. Wright was his wife, also born in Massachusetts in 28. So he was 31 and she was 24 when they founded First Church. Sarah Rainier Edwards, married Stephen Sturgis Edwards, by best we can tell, in 19, 1843. Both are buried at Greenlawn. Sarah Ann is listed as one of our female members at 27 years old. Sarah's mom, listed as Mary Searle, Mrs. Mary Searles, was her mother 61 when she was a founder of First Church. Elizabeth Tuttle was 62 as part of the founding of First Church, and she was the mother of James Tuttle, who was a 30-year-old lawyer when he founded First Church. Now, for those of us who live in the northern part of town, you know Tuttle. Um, they also founded the Tuttle Mall. I know that, that's a little later. <laughs> so they both came from New Jersey, where James was born. 
Lewis L. Rice was a 50-year-old newspaper editor and publisher when he founded First Church. He was the publisher of the Ohio American, which was an abolitionist newspaper. He founded a Cleveland paper called the Cleveland Daily Gazette. He became an attorney and then served as the private secretary for Ohio Governor Salmon Chase. And some of you know who came about that close to being the President of the United States in, uh, and then became a cabinet member for Abraham Lincoln. Um, after Rice edited the Lorain County News all through the Civil War, he moved to Columbus where he served as the superintendent of public printing for the state of Ohio over the next 12 years. He went on to be editor and publisher for the Painesville Telegraph. Sarah Coleman Rice, his wife, was 52 when we were founded. She did, we do not have information on her other than that she was born in Middlefield, Massachusetts and died in Oberlin at the age of 77. She was the mother of two children, Mary and William, who were 14 and 11 when we began. Andrew Gunning was born in Ireland. He was a railroad laborer and engineer. He was 19 when he founded First Church. Born in Ireland with him, at, and they came together, as far as we can tell, was his Irish-born wife, Mary Cook Gunning, who was 17, the youngest of all of our founders, and a homemaker when the church was founded. He lived to 79, she lived to 85. So I'm telling you, they lived long lives. Matthew C. Long was a merchant and 32 when he founded first, and his wife, Hannah Mary Tuttle Long, was 32 when she founded first. Their three children, William was six, Margaret four, and Jacob one when we started. Matthew was actually born in Columbus, which was rare among all of our founders. At the age of 11, you'll love this, Matthew entered the treasurer's office of Franklin County and for six years was the deputy county treasurer. That would be from 11 to 17. <laughs> he, probably it was really well run, let's be honest, right? He spent his winters and springs and, and, and fall in the office, and then summers he went to school. For seven and a half years, he was a clerk in the bookstore of Whiting and Huntington in Columbus, afterward for two years in the same business at the same place under the name Randall, Aston, and Long always having a desire to be a farmer, and with his health failing, he sold his interest in the store and purchased a farm in Licking County, and for 10 years followed agricultural pursuits on the farm. He eventually moved to Iowa, and he was highly successful in farming and business and politics, was a state senator. Then he went on to Southern California, then back to Indiana, then finally to Missouri, and when he was in Indiana, he was president of Wabash College in Indiana. And he lived into his mid-80s, so I guess his health was pretty good in the long run. Long Street is named for Matthew Long. Reverend Warren Jenkins was 48-year-old clergyman and an entrepreneur when founding First Church. He was a merchant, a newspaper man, and a broker, and served as our 11th mayor in the 1830s. His first wife, Marion, was mother of his first four children before her death in 1849, and then he married Mary M. Gardner Jenkins. His second wife was 46 when we were founded. She was the mother of the next five children. She was listed as keeping house. I think he should have stayed home a little too. <laughs> so she was a housekeeper, that's what it says. Dr. John Waterman Hamilton was a 29-year-old physician and married to 26-year-old Rachel Warden Hamilton when they founded First Church. Together they had six children. Dr. Hamilton's obituary painted the portrait of an absolutely beautiful man. Don't you agree, David? It's this beautiful obituary. And an accomplished surgeon who performed some major surgical procedures that had never been tried before. It appears that Rachel was dedicated to raising their six children. There's little more that we have found on her. Sarah Sally Goss was 33 when she founded first and married to Charles Henry Goss who was 35 and a clerk. They had six children. Lydia Conrad Stanton was a 28-year-old homemaker married to Samuel Billings Stanton, a 43-year-old merchant and grocer. When they founded First Church, they had five children. Thomas S. Baldwin 
was a 31-year-old jeweler when he and Matilda Ann Pearson Baldwin, at 32, founded First Church. They had one son, Arthur. But I also want to add that the Baldwin family went on. Dr. James Fairchild Baldwin was a member of First Church when he founded Grant Hospital in 1900. I'm not sure of the relationship there. Finally, I come to the Batums and the Sessions. Michael Boyd Batum was a 39-year-old horticulturist, farmer, and entrepreneur, and one of the most famous agricultural leaders in the mid-19th 18 or in the mid -19th century in Ohio, and became our first Secretary of Agriculture in Ohio. His wife, Josephine Abaya Penfield Cushman Batum, was 23 when we were founded, and a well-known leader who first raised seven children and then went on to found and form and lead the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Watch out, women. <laughs> she, if you wonder where it started, it started in Ohio and First Church. As for Francis and Mary Sessions, it's really hard to begin. And David, you, you're not in agreement. Their list of accomplishments is so long. But we do not have the Columbus Museum of Art or, or, or Columbus School of Art and Design, College of Art and Design, if it's not for Francis and Mary Sessions. They were not only titans of the arts, they were also caregivers for the poor in our community. They had no children. They spent their lives investing in Columbus, Ohio. Francis was successful or excuse me, Mary was successful. She was the only child of Orange and Mary Johnson, two of the founders of Worthington, Ohio. The great thing about her obituary is it says, and she had to move all the way from Worthington to Columbus to live with him. But you think, that's not that far, but back then it was, right? Orange had a very successful comb factory and lots of land in Worthington. Still, the Orange Johnson House is a landmark in Worthington. At the time of Mary's death in 1919, after Francis had died in 1909, she left the city 1.5 million in assets, which were given away to the YWCA, which this congregation founded, and the YMCA and the Art Museum. In 1929, the Art Museum, with the land of the Sessions family, where their mansion was, tore that down and built built the art museum that we have today. And I want to say they took the opening, the, the entranceway to the Sessions home and put it on Bainton Hall, which is still there today. So that's where the offices for the art museum are now, but that's where the first art school was. So they were instrumental in all of this. And it's important to know where they earned their money. Mr. Sessions was one of the leaders of the Jeffrey Company. Sound familiar? And so this, this legacy of love that we see here connects many points. And it was, by the way, Celia Jeffrey, along with other women, who started the Children's Hospital, right, much later. So there's so much more to say about our founders, particularly the final four. And I do want to say two things, real simple. Francis was in charge of, um, during the Civil War, he was in charge of going to battlefields to try to keep uh, as safe as possible, the soldiers, once they were wounded and being tended, um, he was in charge of sewage and, and the problems with uh, those who were in the hospitals. And then um, she uh, went to the inauguration of William Henry Harrison, one of the Ohio governors, and couldn't find a place to stay in Washington, so she ended up staying in a room in a hotel with Alexander Hamilton's, ha Hamilton's wife, Eliza. So I love that little story. So there's all these connections we have, but we can say this. We have four things in the 62,455 days that have passed since the first day of First Church. We have four things that we remain the same. First, we have the communion table, which survived all the way from day one to this day. It has been with us for 62,455 days. It has the light of Christ on it today. It connects us sacramentally and spiritually with our 42 forebears. Second, we have God's word as our constant companion that has been with us for 5,784 years, according to the Jewish calendar and counting. 
we are inspired to follow God's words still today as they were then. Third, we have this deep call to racial justice and being anti-racist, which was an expression so powerfully demonstrated by them at the beginning of our days. Fourth, we have the covenant which you shared today as Leslie and Jim joined. You heard the words, and I want to lift up one more time. Radical words. The church acknowledges that all members have the right of interp individual interpretation of the principles of the Christian faith and respects them in their honest conviction. Those are radical words. That means that each of us comes to understand the faith we hold and treasure as our own. And each of us respects the other in the interpretation we bring to that. Following this covenant leads us to trust God is still speaking. It means we have to trust ourselves enough to challenge what we belong, what we believe is right and what we believe is wrong. And today we pause to give thanks. We give thanks to God for the legacy of our first church forebears, our founders in faith who had the courage and the vision to create this congregation and then trusted God and Jesus Christ to guide the Holy Spirit led church forward. Like Exodus, we can only imagine the hardships and joys they encountered. Like Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, we pray that we can continue to carry forth their encouragement, their love, their com compassion and sympathy, and their humility in looking out for the interests of others. And like Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew today, we have the example of generosity that calls us more deeply every day to be a living, breathing, generous community of faith. As we come to this time today, we've lifted up a few of the names, but I ask that we remember all of the names, all 27 women and 15 men, who had the vision and courage to follow their convictions and create a church home for us here in the heart of Ohio, in the heart of Columbus, and in the heart of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God for each one of them. And thanks be to God for each one of you. Amen.